Buying seeds is more complicated than it should be. There are so many terms floating around. I mean, what do they all mean? Hybrids, open pollinated, heirloom, non-hybrids, non-GMOs. What do all these terms mean? In this video, I'm going to have a look at these terms, sort them out, and help you figure out which ones you need to pay attention to and which ones you can ignore. In the first part of the video, I'll simply explain the terms. In the second part, I'll go through a number of myths surrounding these terms, and then I'll give you my perspective on what I think is important when you're buying seeds. One of the reasons these terms are so confusing is that they're actually talking about different things. Let's start with the term organic seed. Organic seed is seed that's been collected from plants that have been grown on a certified organic farm. It doesn't actually describe the seed itself. It's not going to describe the kind of fruit you get from it. It's describing how the parent plant was grown to make the seed. I know the word organic is floating around all over the place and people associate it with goodness, but it's simply not true. Whether a seed is organic or not, it will produce the same fruit, the same food, it will be just as nutritious, they'll taste the same, the plants will be the same size. Being organic does not affect the plant in your garden. Your growing conditions affect that. The genetics of the cultivar affect that. But whether it's organic or not really makes no difference. In fact, I did a thorough review of this and the only benefit to organic seed is that you're supporting organic growers. And that may actually be a good thing. So if you want to support organic farmers, you can lean towards organic seed. But don't believe all the other nonsense that you've been told about the benefits of organic seed. Now let's look at the term non-treated. What are seeds treated with? Now the first thing to understand is that the treatment of seeds happens after the seed is produced has nothing to do with the genetics of the seed or the quality of the seed or the kind of food it's going to produce. This is a treatment that takes place after the seed is harvested and there's two kinds of treatments. The first type takes the seed and coats it in a fungicide. Some seed, particularly the ones that are planted very early in the spring, tend to rot because the soil is cold and wet. Putting the fungicide around the seed means that it is less likely to rot, more likely to grow into a plant. So seeds treated with a fungicide can produce a much higher yield, but it doesn't change the quality of the seed or the food that's produced. The amount of fungicide on there is very small and very little of that ends up in the food that you're going to pick at the end of the summer. But it is a concern to some people because it is an added chemical. Now the other type of treatment is treatment with a bacteria. So you might know that legumes, the beans and peas, they form an association with a rhizobium bacteria making little nodules on the roots. And the bacteria live in these nodules. And the bacteria are able to take nitrogen from the air and turn it into ammonium, which it gives to the plant. The plant then converts the ammonium to nitrate and it can use it for growing. So it's a way for the plant to get more nitrogen. If you put those peas and beans, the legumes, into soil that already has the bacteria, then they will make the association anyways. But if you're putting this into soil that has not grown legumes, then it's a good idea to inoculate your seeds with this bacteria. And you can buy it in little packs that you put on the seed yourself. Now, once you've grown them like that, then in future years, you probably don't have to add. It. So again, this treatment is not a chemical treatment. It's a bacteria that you're adding. And what it can do for you is give you a much larger harvest. More nitrogen means the plants grow better and you get larger plants, which produces more food. It's as simple as that. So that's not a bad idea. Now, it is important to match the species of bacteria to, to the type of legume that you're growing. And you can look that up online. So that takes care of treated seed or non-treated seed. Non-treated just means none of these things have been added. Well, let's talk about the other non-term. So there's one called 
non-hybrid. Well, that simply means that the seed is not hybrid seed. Now, in recent years, hybrid seed has gotten a bad rep. And some people are going around spreading lies about hybrid seed, about how they're not good for you, they're not healthy, they don't produce good food, and so on. All of that is complete nonsense. Most of the food we grow is hybrid seed. And there are some really good reasons to grow hybrid seed that we're going to discuss in a minute. But the term non-hybrid simply means it's not a hybrid. It doesn't tell you what it is, it just tells you it's something else. Now, I would pretty much ignore that term. Is pretty much a marketing term because people associate non-hybrid with goodness. That isn't true. The other non-term that's very popular now is non-GMO. Now I get a real kick out of this. A GMO seed is one where man has gone in and manipulated the DNA in that seed. Now that sounds like a really scary thing, but it's not. It's only scary if you don't understand what's actually being done. Anyways, GMO is a man-made seed. So that's bad, right? Once gardeners were convinced that GMO is bad, well, then you want to sell a better seed. So we're going to label it all the seed as non-GMO. Well, I got news for you. A gardener cannot buy GMO seed. You have to buy 50-pound bags and you have to sign a license agreement to buy that material. If you buy small amounts of seed for your garden, it is all non-GMO. The term is strictly a marketing term to give you the warm and fuzzies so that you believe this is better seed than the competitor who doesn't label their seed. All gardening seed is non-GMO. So you can pretty much ignore that term. See how easy this is? Now we're down to three terms. Open pollinated, heirloom, and hybrid. Now to understand these terms, you have to understand a little bit about how seed is made. The pollen needs to transfer from the male part of the flower to the female part of the flower. Pollination then takes place and seed is produced. There are two basic ways this happens. In nature, let's take a corn field. Corn is growing, it starts making pollen, and corn, by the way, is wind pollinated. So wind comes along and blows the pollen from the male parts to the female parts. Fertilization takes place. This is what we call open pollinating. Open meaning it takes place in nature. It takes place in an open field. There's nobody standing there actually moving pollen around. We let nature do that. And it could be the wind, it could be bees, it could be moths, it could be a whole range of different insects. But something in nature is moving pollen from one spot to the other. That's open pollinated. On the opposite end of this, we have hybrid. And that's where man comes along and literally takes pollen from one plant and puts it on another plant. In most cases, hybrid seed is a cross between two plants that are different. So if I'm creating a hybrid tomato seed, I'll have a field of tomato A over here and I'll have a field of tomato B over here, and they're actually separated by some distance, so they can't cross-pollinate, that no bees are gonna move pollen back and forth. And then I send out a bunch of people to collect that pollen and move it to the other field and literally go from plant to plant to plant and pollinate, okay? That's a hybrid seed. And that's one of the reasons hybrids cost more because there's a lot of labor involved here. So we have open pollinated, which is done naturally, and we have hybrids, which is done by man. Now in between, we have something called heirloom, just to confuse things. There is no definition for heirloom, which might surprise you because everyone uses the word and it implies goodness, but there's no definition. So one of the definitions floating around says that any seed that has been around for at least 50 years can be called a heirloom. So that means that someone had this seed 50 years ago and is collecting seed from the same plant. Every year they planted, they collect seed, they plant it again, they collect seed. And generally that's an open pollinated system. We just let nature do its thing. At the end of the season, we collect that seed, we store it, next year we plant it again. 50 years. Uh, other people say, no, it has to be 100 years. Another group over here says, well, any seed that was around during World War II is a hybrid seed. 50 years is accepted by many people. But consider this. One of my favorite all-time seeds is the sugar snap pea. 
It was developed in 1979, and most catalogs consider that to be a heirloom, but it hasn't been 50 years. So it's not really a heirloom. So that term is a bit squishy. And quite honestly, I can collect seed from my garden this year and call it a heirloom. There is no registry of these. There's no one that certifies heirloomness. So anybody can call anything a heirloom. And that's one of the problems with this term. But generally what it means is that the seed is usually open pollinated. It's usually passed on from person to person, and it's what we call line bred. The pollen comes from the same plant that will produce the seed, so it's self-pollination. Now, sometimes man does help that pollination process a little. Sometimes it's left till nature, but that's a heirloom. It's just seed that's been around for a long time. All right, now you know the difference between open pollinated, heirloom, and hybrid. Why do you care, and how do you select the best seed. Let's have a look at heirloom seeds. Now there are a number of myths floating around about these seeds. Some people say they taste better. They grow better. The food they produce is more nutritious. Now these things might be true, but there's a very good chance they're not. Let's think about this. A heirloom seed is a seed that someone has been growing for a number of years. And when people collect these seeds, they, they always pick the best fruit, right? You're not going to pick the plant that makes really crummy little tomatoes. You're going to pick the plant that makes the big tomatoes. You're going to pick a plant that's making really good tasting tomatoes. So it's true. Year after year, these tomatoes get better and better, but only where this person is growing the tomatoes. You can take the world's best heirloom tomato that grows in Texas, Bring it up here to Ontario where our climate is completely different, our soil is completely different, and it can be one of the worst tomatoes you've ever eaten. Flavor and growth and nutrition has so much to do with your soil and your climate, and it has something to do with genetics. But just because a seed is heirloom does not mean it's going to grow well or taste good. The other problem we have with heirloom seed is that a lot of heirloom seed is grown by smaller growers. And one of the big problems with heirloom is cross-pollination. So if you're collecting your own seed in your own backyard and your neighbor happens to grow a different variety of the same kind of plant, let's say cucumbers or squash, that pollen will move from his garden into your garden. And that means that your cucumber is no longer a pure cucumber strain. It should really no longer be called heirloom because it's a new hybrid, but you don't know that pollen came over. So you continue to grow it and you continue to call it a heirloom. So the quality of heirloom is somewhat questionable. Unless it's grown by larger organizations, they're very good about keeping these fields separate so that they don't get any cross-pollination. Home growers don't do that very well. Let's talk about cost. We mentioned that hybrids are very labor intensive and so they cost more. So if you're looking for a less expensive option, open pollinated or heirloom are generally a better deal on a cost per seed basis. Heirlooms are more expensive. Some gardeners want to collect their own seed. So my sugar snap peas, which I mentioned earlier, sometimes I buy them and sometimes I collect them. If you're going to collect your own seed from year to year and grow it, don't plant hybrids. The reason is this, that the person who made the hybrid has very carefully selected these two plants, A and B, and brought that pollen together. And when it's brought together, it actually produces a plant that is much more vigorous, has higher yields, it grows better. But when you collect the seed from that, you get a wide variety of different plants. Hybrids do not grow true from seed. So if you want to collect your own seed year to year, stay away from the hybrid. It's rare that hybrid seed that you collect will be better or even as good as the parent it came from. It's generally worse. Disease resistance is also a criteria that will help you select between seeds. In general, heirloom seeds do not have good disease resistance. Now, there are certainly exceptions, and people who have been growing the cucumber in an area that has a certain disease and has selected for the ones that have less and less disease, over time they do become resistant. 
But in most cases, the hybrid are more disease resistant than heirlooms or open pollinated. The reason for that is that the people who produce that seed are selecting that A and B crop that they're going to cross, and they select those to make sure they have the resistant genes in them. When we create hybrid seeds, we know what resistance there is, and in most catalogs, those are listed, and it will tell you whether it's resistant to a certain disease. In general, if you have a disease problem, go with heirlooms. Now, late blight was a problem a couple years ago, and I think I had a little bit of it again last year in tomatoes. There are now some late blight resistant tomatoes on the market. Now, most of them are the smaller type tomatoes, but over the next couple years, you can expect hybrid tomatoes to be bred with that disease resistance into the large beefsteak type tomatoes. All right, so I hope at this point you understand what the different terms mean and you have some guidance as to which ones to select. So how should you go about selecting seeds? There's just so many to pick from. Well, here's what I do. I'm not going to buy a heirloom seed because it's heirloom. I'm not going to buy an organic seed because it really doesn't offer me anything. I'm not going to go out of my way to look for hybrids either. I sit down and figure out what it is that I want from this plant. I grow in a cold climate and one of the most important things for me is a long growing season. So I need something with a short maturity date. That's the first thing I look for. Second one is I do like disease resistance. The last thing I want to do is grow something for two or three months and I'd have it die due to a disease. So I do always look at that disease resistance, particularly if I had the disease in the past. Sometimes I like to collect my own seed. And so if I want to do that, I know I have to stay away from hybrids. But then the all-time favorite cherry tomato is the Sweet 100. That's my personal opinion. I've been growing it for 40-some years. It's a hybrid, so I have to buy that hybrid seed. I can't collect my own. I have a few heirloom tomato seeds that I've been growing, and now I collect that seed from year to year, and I don't have to buy it. And those are also good-tasting tomatoes but they don't compare with the sweet 100. A friend of mine sells a lot of heirloom seeds, and so I'll get some seed from her to give it a try. I mean, some heirloom do taste better, but again, it's important to understand that it has to be grown locally to taste well. Heirloom seed from way over there in a different climate does not mean it's going to work well here. I was recently given some seed from Italy of this tomato that's supposed to be really special. I thought, great. Of course, it will be a heirloom because it's been cultivated for a very long period of time. And I grew it and it wasn't a very good tomato, not in my soil. Personally, I don't worry too much about the cost. I think seed is pretty inexpensive and I'm not growing large amounts. I have a fairly small vegetable garden. I want a few plants for me. And the cost of seed is kind of trivial compared to the effort it takes to grow those. So I ignore cost. Bottom line, don't believe everything you hear out there about hybrids. Hybrids are actually very good seed. Pick the seed that you think will grow well in your climate. Get the right maturity date. Try different ones for flavor. Pick one that you really like. And ignore most of the labels. Neither heirloom nor hybrid is better and neither one is worse. Get seed that grows well for you and forget the labels. Have a great vegetable garden next year. And by the way, if you want to learn how to grow things from seed, I've got quite a few videos that take you through the whole process. Vegetable seeds, flowers, trees, shrubs, peonies. I grow pretty much everything from seed, and I've grown some like 2,000 different types of plants from seed. All those videos will be in the top right-hand corner. See you next time.